Sabbath peace. Sabbath peace. It's another opportunity for us to hear and learn of the word of truth as given to us by the Most High God. We know all honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast, and given freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe. In this state, we should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that we do give, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that we may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. That said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that are watching in, but no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. Let's open up to John chapter, chapter 7, verse 14. I'm going to hit him with the trifecta today. Watch this. We're going to go to John chapter 7, verse 14. Then I want John chapter 6, verse 44. I'm going to show y'all a holy trinity. <clears throat> this is John chapter 7. You probably want the other one. That's, uh, that's New King James. You can read it if you want to, but the words won't be exactly what you're hearing. And the same thing, though, no, for the most part. This is John chapter 7, verse 14. Watch what he said. Now, about the midst of the feast, Yahushua went up into the temple and taught. All right, he said, It's the midst of the feast. So he said, It's the middle of the darn feast. He went into the temple and he wanted to teach. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? So he asked the question. He said, How does he know the scriptures? When he say letters, talking about the scriptures, he said, How does he know the scriptures? He never learned them, right? They assumed he never learned because they haven't seen him around here. They didn't see him go and, and learn from any of the any of the known teachers. They're like, oh, he know the scriptures, and he never learned, right? Let's hear about it. Yahushua answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. So Yahushua, he answered, and he said, my doctrine that you're hearing, that thing ain't mine, but it's him who sent me. So he said, I'm teaching. Remember, doctrine is teaching. He said, I'm teaching you the stuff of him who sent me. Talking about the Father. All right, keep going. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So if you do the will of the Father, then you'll know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether it be of a man who speaketh. All right? That's important for us because it gives us a formula to understand something. All right? It gives us a way to understand. If we obey what we know, then we will learn more. Right. We will know that the doctrine that we have comes from the most high God. A lot of the hold up that we've been getting and the reason why people can hear stuff from the Bible and it don't retain it or don't understand it correctly or how they can't decipher false doctrine from true doctrine is because we haven't obeyed the things that we do know. The simple things. Right. Right. The milk. We haven't obeyed that. Let's go to Isaiah chapter uh, 28. I told you that's the trifecta. After that, we're going to go to John chapter 6, verse 44. All right? So he said, he asked him, he was like, how did this man know? You know what I'm saying? How he know the scriptures? He ain't never learned. He told him, my doctrine, right? My doctrine is from him who sent me. And any man who do his will, talking about the Father, any man who do the Father's will will know if it is of him or if I speak it of myself. All right? This is Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? He said, whom shall he teach knowledge? And watch what he say next. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? And there goes that doctrine word again. All right? He said, my doctrine is from him who sent me. And if you do his will, then you'll know if the doctrine is coming from me or coming from him. Right? So he said, who is he going to teach knowledge to? And who is he going to make understand the what? Doctrine. Those just what? Are what them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Uh-huh. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. So he lays it out for it. He tried to lay out the difficulty of it. He said it doesn't make sense that a baby is going to learn this. Right? Because you have to put precept upon precept. Right? Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Let's listen to it. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Uh-huh. 
For with stammering lips and another tongue, will he speak to this people? He said he'll speak to the people with stammering lips and another tongue, meaning he'll speak to them in a way that's going to be difficult for them to understand. Right? This is the Most High God laying out how the word is going to be given. Right? This is why Yahushua is saying, he's li listen, I understand y'all might not know that this doctrine, if this doctrine is coming from me, if I'm making it up, or if this came from the Father. But if y'all do the Father's will, you'll know, you'll be able to recognize true doctrine from fake doctrine. Right? Keep going. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest, wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. And since they wouldn't hear, let's see what happened. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For what reason? That they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. The reason that it's like that for them is so that they'll be trapped. They'll be taken. Right? A snare be laid for them. All right, that's what we look at. And it all happens because it's given to us intentionally from God in a way that's difficult, that's challenging for our understanding. To overcome that, we have to obey the small pieces that we do know. And then from there, he increases our understanding. Hebrews chapter uh, what? Five? Hebrews chapter five, verse 12. We still going to go get John chapter 6, verse 44. But before that, Hebrews chapter 5, verse Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. All right, remember, doctrine is teaching, right? Same word, all right? He said this is doctrine, talking about teaching, right? So he said y'all should be teachers, but now y'all need somebody to teach y'all the word. The first oracles, he said, that means the basics, right? Let's hear about it. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. He said, you just like somebody who need milk and not strong meat. Remember, in Isaiah chapter 28, he said, who is he going to teach the knowledge to? Those just wing from the what? Milk. Yep. And draw them from the breast. And now, now we reading over here, Paul telling me, look, I mean, uh, the writer of Hebrews is telling him, he's looking at him like, y'all, y'all should be teachers. But y'all some people now, y'all act like y'all need milk and not strong meat. Let's hear about it. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. He said, if you use milk, you're unskilled in the word of righteousness. You're just a baby. Who's, who is he going to teach the knowledge to? Those just drawn from the milk or drawn from the breast? No, precept got to be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. How are you going to get it if you're just a baby? He said, you unskilled with the word if you only dabble in milk. Watch that. Watch what he say, though. He give us a solution. <laughs> but, but strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even those who by reason of By use, reason of what? Use. By reason of what? Use. That's practice. By reason of use. That means you take what you've learned and you put it into practice. Right? Obedience. Any little thing that we learn, if we obey it, it can increase our knowledge. He said the strong meat belongs to those that by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So by doing what you learn, by being a hearer and a doer, it then increases your understanding to discern good and evil. So if somebody tells you this is what God has for you in your life and this is what the Bible is saying. You'll be able, based off of your obedience to what you already learned, be able to say if this good doctrine or evil doctrine. And we started off with Yahushua saying, this doctrine is y'all here, right? It's not mine. It's of the Father. And if you do his will, you will understand whose doctrine it is. It's the same thing. If you do the will, you'll understand. It's the same thing that he's telling us here. 
very important that we understand that. It's John chapter 6, verse 44. If we understand that, it empowers us, right? It becomes another, another carry that we have from the Most High God. Otherwise, we, we out here and we, we put ourselves in a position to be deceived and to believe false doctrine and be swayed to and fro, as the book would call it. This is John chapter 6, verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. He said the only way a man going to come to him is the Father got to draw him. Right? Let's hear about it. And I will raise him up at the last day. Okay. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. The prophets wrote, and they shall be all taught of God. So let's keep the theme going. He says the only way somebody is going to get to him is if they're sent by the Father. And after that, he'll raise them up at the last day. And he said the prophets wrote that everybody's going to be taught of God. Let's hear about it. So anybody... Every man, therefore, that has heard and has learned of the Father comes unto me. So if nobody comes unto the Son unless the Father sent him, right, he draws him, then if you hear and learn of the Father and come to him, what does that mean? That means to be drawn by the Father is to be, to hear and learn the word, Right? We can put a whole lot of these other things that people will try to make a feel, but you got to just, sometimes God just got to draw you. And a lot of times you feel like, you feel like it's some supernatural feeling or, or some connection with God and your intuition. It's like, I just feel like God is drawing me towards this career, or drawing me to the ministry or drawing me to have kids or drawing me to do all these different things we can feel in our life, right? In reality, the most High God said, you got freedom in all of those things. You do what you want to do. All I want you to do is obey my word. Outside of that, you do what you want to do. And I'll honor. He'll honor the things that we want to do. We just said, just obey my word while you're doing them. Right? The thing that he's drawing us to is hearing and learning the word. If we hear the word, we learn the word, we go on to the father. And nobody goes to the father unless the father, I mean, go and we go on to the son. And nobody goes to the son unless the father first draw him. Right. That's how things play out. That's how we have to look at this. We hear the word. We learn the word. The only way we can learn the word is by obeying the word. Then by reason of use, our senses are exercised and we can discern good from evil. That way we can learn more of the word. And by learning through that process of continually learning the word, continually obeying the word, we end up reaching the son. The son then connects us with the father and all is one and we share in one glory as before before the world was, right? These are the things that have to be the goal for us. These are the things, these are the promises from God that has to be the most important. Our resurrection and being like the Father, being like the Son, right? Let's grab uh, Acts 27 where we left off. Acts 27 verse 1. So we left off last week, we were dealing with Paul, right? Paul had to keep on testifying. I was telling everybody, man, this is what I went through. This is what they did. This is why I did it. Nobody believed him. He appealed to Caesar. Then uh, King Agrippa wanted to hear him. Paul was like, King Agrippa, you know about the Hebrews, right? You know about us. You know where we're from. You hang around Judah. You know our laws. You know our customs. He was like, let me, you know what I'm saying? Keep it real. You know what I'm talking about. This ain't strange to you. He was like, keep it real. This stuff didn't happen. You know what I'm saying? Just tell me about it. King Agrippa was like, man, you almost convinced me to be a Christian. Right? And Paul was like, man, I wish everybody who heard me was just like as I am. Right? And after that, King Griffin was like, man, honestly, you would have been set free. Right? You would have been set to liberty, but you appealed to Caesar. So you got to go to Caesar. Right? Remember, we talked about it. That was God's plan all along. Right? We went all the way back in the Acts. I think uh, we went all the way, what, Acts 19? And we, we were talking about how, how uh, Paul already knew. He was like, man, I got to go to Rome. Paul already knew the plan. Right, so he was just looking at following God's plan. Take a man of God to do that, a woman of God to do that. To have something, even though it creates discomfort for you and it creates a challenge for you, you know the goal and you trust God to follow it through. Right? We talked about the examples of, of Paul when he was in jail, right? And he was praying. The book said he was praying. Then after he got after while he was praying, earthquake happened. And all the all the cell doors opened up. 
right? And we were looking like most of nine, nine times out of ten, the way we taught the Bible today, we would have saw that as that's a blessing from God. It's time to me get out of here. I mean, you praying, you in jail, you not supposed to be in jail. They 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 wrongly put you in jail. Then the cell doors just open up while you in jail, and you just got done praying, asking God to let you out. Two of them things open up, you oh thank the Lord, you walking right up out of there. But Paul didn't because he looked, he knew he was like that's not how God works. God ain't about to put me in a situation where I gotta escape. He gonna put me in a situation where they gonna tell me I'm free. Right? We talked about another example of uh, Egypt. When we were in Egypt, it was well in God's power to just plague them and just say, "Go ahead and walk out of here." But each time he had Moses go to Pharaoh and ask, "Could they leave?" Because God is a man of authority. He puts people in authority for a reason. He'd never have us buck up against authority. Right? What he's going to do is he's going to make authority bow down to him. That's what it's about. It's all about his glory. It ain't never is about us. Never about us looking good. It's always about his glory. And we have to look at that. We have to say, does God get glory out of this? And don't try to lean on your understanding when you answer that question. Don't try to say, well, I mean, technically he can get glory because if I look good, he look good. Nah. Nah, you look like darn rags. He'll look good, though, because he'll bring you out. That's what it's about. It's about him looking good at all times. Right? That's the reason why a lot of our prayers don't get answered. A couple reasons. One, we don't obey his word. Right? And so now we gotta we gotta minimalize our prayers, right? We gotta make it, we gotta make it to, we gotta make it to, you know what I'm saying? Well, God just blessed me by waking up this morning. Right? We gotta make our prayers mean nothing. Right? And try to act like that's something just because we know that's something we already gonna get. Right? We we expect, we fully expect that tomorrow we're gonna wake up. Right. Just through life, that becomes an expectation for us. All right. So now since that becomes our prayer. Right. Oh, well, he just wake me up. Thank God for that. This, that, another. Now we can say he answered our prayer. Right. We can't outsmart God. Just obey his word and trust in him. If you speak to him and you honest with him and you look like and you obey his word and you trust in him and you speak to him and you honest, you do all those things to the most high God. Then you can let him know this thing make you look good. God, how do you think Moses did it? Most of our God was about to wipe out all of our people, all the Israelites. He was about to wipe us all out. Moses was like, man, you do that. You mess around. Everybody who, everybody who you, you just showed your glory to, God, everybody you just did that, they're going to think you wasn't strong enough to bring us out. They're going to think, man, he brought us out of Egypt and then left us in the wilderness to die because he wasn't strong enough. Most of our God turned back from him. He was like, you know what, all right. All right, get out of my face. Right? That's what we want to see. We have to have a candid and honest conversation with the Most High God. But it starts with us being honest with ourselves. Where are we at? Right? Where are we at? How does God view us? Right? You have to be able to answer those questions. Because then when you answer that question, then you can talk to God. But you have to know the word. Have to know it. This is Acts 27.1. Yeah. Go ahead. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. All right. So they're going to Italy now. Remember, they got to they got to go to Rome. They got to they got to go uh, meet with Caesar. All right. Because he appealed to Caesar. So now appealing to Caesar is like appealing to the Supreme Court. So Y'all may have heard on the news how how uh, how Donald Trump put a travel ban in. Right. And after that, you know what I'm saying, certain states challenged that travel ban, so it had to go to a court. So that's kind of what's happening with Paul. He has a disagreement with another group of people, and then they have to go to a court. So when they go to that court, then they make their case. If they don't like the ruling of that, they can appeal. They can challenge that ruling. Then it has to go to a higher court. So this is what Paul has been doing, right? We've been reading through Acts, and Paul goes to one court, then he has to go to a higher court, then he has to go to a higher court, and then eventually he just says, I appeal to Caesar. So that's like the Supreme Court, right? So that's what Donald Trump just did. He just asked for the Supreme Court to review his travel ban and reinstate it because he's challenging. He's appealing to Caesar, right? So that's what, that's what Paul did. So now Paul is like, to appeal to Caesar, I got to do some traveling. But he's a prisoner. So now they have him in a ship. They put him in a ship. And then he's saying, once it was determined that we are definitely about to go to I Italy, this is what happened. Keep going. And, ending, and entering into a ship of 
at Drumit at Drumitium, we launched meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica being with us, and the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto, unto his friends to refresh himself. All right, so they knew he wasn't a sinner. These are sinners, right? These are sinners, wicked Gentiles, right? But they knew they were dealing with a man of God. They'd do it. And even if they didn't know they were dealing with a man of God, they knew they wasn't dealing with a man who was a threat. They wasn't dealing with a man who was evil, a man that was going to make them look crazy. So they gave them liberty. When they say liberty, they're talking about freedom. So they're going, they're traveling. They go to uh, another place. And what they told him was, go ahead. You got, you got some people out here. Go ahead and see him. He's a prisoner, though. But they give him freedom to go meet with his friends and all that because they trust that the man will come back. All right? Randy, you mind uh, give me some water? Just two bottles of water. You want some water? Lord, give me uh, three bottles of water if you don't mind. Huh? Mark out. <laughs> uh, but you know, we we see that what they're doing is they're trusting him because they know he ain't. They ain't gonna make them look crazy, right? So even even in his bondage, the Most High God gives them favor with men. All through obedience, the Most High God can work with us if we got obedience. He can work with us. It's a lot of stuff that he can do when we got to be. When we don't have, a, it just make it real difficult. Make it real difficult. Keep going. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Uh huh. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myrna, a city of Lycia. Mm -hmm. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. Mm -hmm. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Snidus, the wind, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmon. All right. So what he's saying is, as they sailing, the storm starting to come in. Right. The wind starting to get more rough. So it's certain directions they couldn't go. You remember they on a sailboat. So if the wind blow a certain direction, you kind of got to go with the wind. All right? You got to go with the wind. Keep going. And hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Heavens. The Fair Heavens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lacia. Uh huh. Now, when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said, "All right." Them, so after the fast, fast. When he say fast, he most likely is talking about our day of atonement. Right, day of atonement. We would fast. All right. So when we look at these things, he most likely talking about that. All right. But he said once the fast was over, then he admonished them. Right. He warned them. Watch what Paul said to him. And said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be, will be, well, will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the landing and ship, but also of our lives. All right. So he said, the way we going, somebody going to lose some darn lives. He said, that's what I perceive. It feel like somebody going to lose some darn lives. Right. Keep going. And so. Uh, Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Uh -huh. And because the haven was not, wait, sorry. and because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenix and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete and lies towards the southwest and northwest. All right. So on, on their way to see Caesar. They run into a lot of adversity, right? So now they got to take a lot of detours. They're trying to come up with different routes. They're trying to strategize. So let's see what happens. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, losing there, they sailed close by Crete. Mm -hmm. But not long after there arose against it tempo tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. Euroclidon. All right, so they had a, a strong wind. You know how they name like the tornadoes and everything, Hurricane Katrina and, and uh, El Nino and all that. They named this wind here. They named this storm too. All right. And when the
when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. Mm -hmm. And running under a certain island, which is called Claudia, Cloda, we had much work to come by the boat, mm -hmm. which when they had taken up, they used helps undergrinding the, under the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. Mm -hmm. And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest the next day, they lightened the ship. All right, so they're going, they, the, the, the ship is being tossed. He said exceedingly tossed. The, the ship feels like it's being thrown back and forth. So it's like, man, with that happening, they start throwing stuff off of the ship, right? All the equipment, all the, the supplies they got on there, they just start throwing it off of the ship because the ship's too heavy, it's going to be easier to sink. All right, so it's like, let's throw this thing off. So they start lightening up the ship. Watch this. And the third day, we cast out with our hands, with our own hands, the tackling of the ship. Mm -hmm. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, mm -hmm. all hope that we should be saved was taken away. All right, so everybody was like, we about to die. All right? Everybody on the boat turned, we about to die. Now, remember, Paul told them, I proceed, this thing about to come with law, even life. All right? Keep going. They already lost some of the stuff that he said that they were going to lose because they have to take throw stuff off of the ship. All right, keep going. But, with, but after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete. He said, I told y'all not to leave. All right? He said, you should have listened to me. I told y'all not to leave. All right? Remember, he a prisoner, though. We look at him, that's Paul. You know, that's the apostle of the Most High God. We look at him, we for sure would have took his advice, right? We like to believe so at least. Right, but you look at you look at them. This is a prisoner. They don't know this man. They don't know what he talk, what he's talking about. They just know he a cool dude. He don't he don't be doing nothing wrong. He seemed pretty ethical, right? Huh? Yeah, and they feel yeah. That's a good point. They feel like they know what they're doing, right? So Paul, he get up and he stand up. Man, I told y'all not to leave. What else he say? Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete. Mm -hmm. And to have gained this harm and loss. Mm -hmm. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. Mm -hmm. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Now, the first time he just said, I perceive. This time he said, angel of God stood by me this time. Right? He said, ain't going to be no loss of nobody, no, no, no life on this ship. All right? Watch what he said. He said, there stood by me an angel of God, whose I am, and who I what? And whom I serve. Uh-huh. Saying, fear not, Paul, you must be brought before Caesar. And look, God has given you all them that will that sail with you. You think Paul was scared? Right? When you look at it and you got so much that much faith in God, you're like, well, I know I got to go to Caesar. He told me that. Yeah, the ship messing up, it's scary. I get, I get it, but I know I got to go to Caesar. God told me that. Most like God told him, don't even be scared, Paul. What else? Therefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Uh huh. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. Right? So he said, go back to the one verse from there. Saying, Fear not, Paul, you must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God has given you all them that sail with you. He said, God has given you all them that sail with you. Right? Did he do it for their sake? All for Paul's sake. All right? Everybody that's with him now. Everybody live. He started off, he was like, man, I perceive this thing. Somebody going to die. You think Paul was talking about himself? No, he wasn't even worried about himself. Man, I mean, look, y'all going away. Somebody going to mess around and die. He's just trying to warn them. Don't want to do it. Somebody going to die. I perceive that. Later on, the most high God was like, man, don't worry about it. Everything going to be lost. But ain't nobody's life going to be lost. All right? Everybody that's with you, everybody going to live. That's the importance of what we do. Just being with a man of God, right? Being near a man of God has the potential of helping you, right? Being near a woman of God, being near someone who the Most High God has a plan and has a trajectory for can potentially help you, right? But what happens when we get into a place where we don't want to obey God? We tend to push those people out of our lives which puts us outside. It puts us in a place where we end up being judged or we end up being hurt or being in a challenging situation without, without the hope. All right? 
we look at we look at that's the natural response. Go to uh, go to uh, Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter twenty five. Right, we have plenty of kings who got word from 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 prophets. Right, we have Ahab. Right, he came. This prophet came to him in uh, uh, Jeroboam. I mean, uh, him and uh, uh, Jehoshaphat. That's what I'm trying to say. Him and Jehoshaphat. All right. And they have had a prophet, and he is like, man, I've locked him up. He, you know what I'm saying? Every time he come around, he always prophesy something against me. He like, I don't like it. the rest of the prophets saying, yeah, Ahab, you got it. You're going to take Gilgal, I think it was. He was like, you know what I'm saying? Ahab, you're going to take it. You good. The rest of them just lying. And he's like, but him, he always, he always just saying something. You know what I'm saying? He never prophesied good towards me. So what he do? This the, is this the only man of God that's around him. And what he going to do with him? Pushed him away, locked him up. Right? Same thing with uh Zedekiah. Right? Jeremiah used to preach to him. He should tell him stuff. What'd he do? He used to listen to Jeremiah sometimes though. Right? But he didn't obey it. He just heard him out. Right? A lot of times what he'd do is he'd let the people around him push him away. He would he was too. He was too popular with the people that wanted to do wrong. That's how it ends up. We put ourselves in positions where... He believed Jeremiah. He was just scared of... I didn't believe him. He liked to acknowledge it. Yeah. He believed it. You obey it. He kept asking Jeremiah, like, so what God say? You know he was intrigued by that thing. He knew it was something up. He yeah. knew what he doing wasn't right. He tried to do it in secret. He ain't want nobody to know. He wasn't know. That's up a mess us up. It's Second Chronicles chapter 25. Give me verse 14. And the pots and the shovels and the snuffers and the spoons and the vessels of brass wherewith they uh, ministered. Second Chronicles? Oh, man, I mean Second Kings. Let me get Second Chronicles, chapter 25, verse 14. Now it came to pass after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites that he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods and bowed down himself before them and burned incense unto them. All right, so Amaziah is a king of Judah. All right, he was a king of Judah. So he went and he took over the Edomites, which were in Mount Seir. They were south of Judah. Right? So he went and he took over them. All right? And then he stole their, their, their gods and he brought them back and he bowed down to them. Now watch what happens. And burn incense unto them. That's why the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah and he, said un, he sent unto him a prophet which said unto him, Why have you sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of your hand? Most I got, anytime, let me tell you something. A lot of these people try to tell us, you know, God speak to you in mysterious ways. When God speak you, you I mean, sometimes you just don't understand it. It's like a riddle. When you read his word, it's a riddle. When the most high God speak, every time we read about it, that thing is the most logical thing you're going to find in the book. Always pure logic. He asks a simple question. Why would you go take some people's gods who couldn't even defend them? What sense does that make? That's they God and you just conquered them. And you're going to bow down to them. He said, that, that, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. We look at this stuff and we try to pretty it up and make it all like, ooh, gloomy. Because you know what? When something is like hidden and you don't really understand it, you can, you can kind of interpret your own meaning out of it. So that's why we like it. That's why we like to say God works in the mysterious ways and all these things. And we can say, you really don't know what God doing in my life. Yeah, I'm smoking crack right now, but you don't know what God doing in my life. All right? Yeah, no, no, no. It looked like, it looked like I'm living with my girlfriend. But you don't know what God doing in my life. All right? You can't judge me because you don't know. Because it gives... That gives us, the, we, we feel like that gives us some room to operate, some room to do what we want to do, right? And then people can't look at us and judge us and say that God is displeased with us. So now we can have our cake and eat it too. We can say God is pleased with us and God loves me. And at the same time, I'm sending away. That stuff going to send people to hell. 
right? Most High God is very logical. He's just saying, listen, you thought it made sense to go take some people, God, and bow down to them when you conquered them? And they was worshiping that God when you conquered them? What that God going to do for you? Let's hear about it. He sent them a prophet. This is what the prophet said to you. That makes a lot, a lot of sense. You think Amaziah would be like, you know what? Let me get rid of these guys. It ain't going to make no sense. You right. That was stupid of me. They are burning some incense to some guys that couldn't even protect their own people. All right? That you right. That thing didn't make no sense. You would think that's what Amaziah said. Let's see. And it came to pass as he talked with him that the king said unto him, Are you made of the king's council? He, so, wait a minute. The king looked at him and was like, Are you part of my council? Did I hire you? Are you my lawyer? Are you, are you my counselor? Do I seek any advice from you? Did I ask you to come here? That's what he looking, he looking at him. So he gave him some good advice, asked him a good question, you know, a thought-provoking question. And he looked at him like, I don't think you're a part of my cat. I don't think I invited you here. Let's hear about it. Forbear. He said, hold on, right? Hold yourself. Watch your darn mouth. That's what forbear means. Watch your mouth. Relax. Calm down. Stop. Right? What else? Why should you be smitten? He said, otherwise you're going to get hit. Right? That's the sentence that he did. I'm just trying to translate it. What he just said is, he said, wait a minute. First of all, did I ask you? Why don't you relax knocked before out. you get knocked out? That's what he's saying. He's a king. This man just rolled up, asked him a thought-provoking question. And he's just looking at it like, first of all, it's none of your business. And you might want to relax before you get knocked out. Right? Let's see. Then the prophet and said, I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and have not listened unto my counsel. Prophet just walk out. He got, probably got a smart mouth. Right? That's the king he's talking to. Probably got a smart mouth. Yeah, okay. I know you going to hell. That's what he's pretty, pretty much saying to I know hell, they weren't looking at the concept of hell like that, but that's how we look at it today. I know you're going to hell because you still doing this and you're not listening to what I just told you. He said, I know God set up, set you up to be to destroy you. He said, I already know it. Because if he didn't, you'll be listening to what I'm talking about. Right? He got right out of Dodge. Right? Keep going. Then Amaziah Judah took advice and sent to Joash, the son of Jehoash, son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us see one another in the faith. Uh-huh. And Joash. So, so now remember. We got two kingdoms. We got the kingdom of Judah and we got the kingdom of Israel. Right? So Amaziah, after he got done talking to the prophet, he feeling himself. He out here feeling. He just got off on Edomites. And he was like real strong in war. Right? He just wiped out the Edomites. Right? We didn't really do that before. He just wiped out the Edomites. So he's like, man, okay, this is easy work. Then we got our two kingdoms. So he is like, you know what? Let me send a message to Israel real quick. He talked big trash. Yo, G. Hugh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why don't you come see me to my face, boy? He talked real Right? Bad. He was like, why don't we see face to face? Let's go at it. You hard? Come on, G. Hugh. He just got knocked off some people. Let's do it, G. Hugh. What did G. Hugh say to him? And Joash, the king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, king of Judah, saying, The thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar. That was in Lebanon saying, give your daughter to my son, the wife. And there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon and trolled down the thistle. You say, lo, you have smitten the Edomites and your heart has lifted thee up to boast. Abide now at home. Why should you meddle to your hurt that you should fall even though even you and Judah with you? Right. All right. So excuse me. I meant Joash. Right. Joash. Joash looking at him like. So he gave him a parable first, right? He told him a, a small thistle, you know what I'm saying, called out to a, a large cedar. And after that, a wild beef just trampled down the thistle. So in other words, he's saying, boy, you got lucky. You know what I'm saying? You're not as hard as you think you is. He's like, man, don't come around here starting no trouble because you're going to mess around and get hurt. You and, you. and your whole, your whole uh, 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 tribe, your whole kingdom. Right? So he's looking at it, he's trying to let him know, you need to relax. What do you think Amaziah did? You think he listened? Let's look at it. But Amaziah would not hear, for it came of God that he might deliver them into the hand of their enemies, mm -hmm. because they sought after the gods of Edom. Mm -hmm. So Joash, the king of Israel, went up, and they saw one another in the face. Both right. he and Amaziah, king of Judah, they met at Beth Shemesh, 
which belongs to Judah. Uh huh. Keep going. And Judah was put to the worst before Israel. In other words, Judah got their butt whooped. He said, put to the word. In other words, Judah got their butt whooped. Right? Keep going. And they fled every man to his tent. And Joash, the king of Israel, took Amaziah, king of Judah, the son of Joash, the son of Jehoahaz, at Beth Shemesh, and brought him to Jerusalem, and broke down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate, 400 cubits. He put a big old hole in Judah. Right? Put a big old hole right in Jerusalem. That's our capital. He put a big old hole in it just so he could access it whenever he wants to. Remember, Jerusalem was close to where uh, Israel was, right? So he put a hole in it, and whenever I want access, I'll come down here and get it. You starting mess, boy. What's wrong with you? Keep going. And he took all the gold and the silver and all the vessels that were found in the house of God mm -hmm. with Obed-Edom and the treasures of the king's house and the hostages also and returned to Samaria. Uh-huh. And Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived after the death of Joash, the son of Jehoash, king of Israel. Mm -hmm. of Amaziah, first to the last. Behold, they are are they not written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel? Okay. What happened to Amaziah? Now, after the time that Amaziah did turn away from following the Lord, they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem. And he fled to Lachish, but they sent to Lachish after him and killed him there. And they brought him up on horses and buried him with his fathers in the city of Judah. All that after isolating himself from the man of God. You think he saw all that coming? Just from one conversation from some man he don't even know. Tell him something right, though. Some man he don't even know. Come on to him, he's like, first of all, it's none of your business. You better relax or you might get smacked. And all that, just a chain of events happened after that. And before he know it, he gone. It's dangerous for us. It's dangerous. Even if we find ourselves in a place where we sin, last thing you want to do is keep... Take, uh, keep a man of God or a woman of God out of your life. You have to be near righteousness. Right? What do you think that would, would happen if they threw ball, Paul off the boat? They done. Paul told them, man, I perceive the way y'all going, y'all going to mess around and die. If they just throw Paul right off the boat, they're like, man, he's gone. Anybody think about you? They're done. That's it. They're dead on that road. We have to put ourselves near people of the Most High God. I mean, even if we ain't righteous, he'll mess around and hit them off. And we're going to be near it. Yeah, Israel wasn't righteous. They was just getting rid of Amaziah. All of this stuff is by association. Right? But it's difficult for us. Because when you're these, uh, go to John, this is John 3.16. Let's grab it. <laughs> John 3.16. You're a good Christian. You'll be able to quote it. We didn't have to go to it. I know. You got to cut that out. This is John 3.16. It's funny, we find, we find a lot of pride in stuff that God ain't never called us. Stuff that God called us, though, that stuff is uncomfortable for us. It's a condition. A lot of stuff is just, it's just conditioning that, that has been kind of fed to us, which is natural, right? It's natural because if somebody tells you something your whole life and you, you become comfortable with it and your mind has been settled on it, that's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's difficult, right, to kind of split up. But that's what we come to do. We come to kind of break all this stuff that we've been taught in our minds and learn it right from the book. You learn it from the book, you ain't going to see it. All right, you ain't gonna see. You ain't never seen Paul call nobody a Christian. You ain't gonna never see uh, Peter call nobody a Christian. Not no disciple. All right, you ain't never see the book call us a Christian. It'll tell you how somebody else called us Christians. You ain't gonna see it called us Christians. So, all right, it's important. It called us what disciples all through the book. Disciples. Why was that the the most used word for them? But it's the least used word for us to describe ourselves. You hear somebody call themselves a disciple every now and again. It's usually a special, special type of reference, though. All right? Why well, got to be a special reference for us? If for them, it was just somebody who obeyed the Most High God. That's why we got to recondition ourselves. We have to recondition ourselves away from a lot of the traditions and stuff that we've been taught. Condition ourselves into what God, how God sees. If we can see ourselves how God sees us, 
as worthless servants that that are to his every uh, uh, to his every move to his every uh, command. It'll do something for us, right? It'll break us away from a lot of this stuff, a lot of these traditions, the stuff that we find, and it take us over well over half our lives to split away from these Christmases and these Easter's. You know, now that we come into the knowledge, we looking, oh man, I don't know what this stuff was. Imagine how much we done. Remember, right now we we kind of frown on it. We know this stuff ain't about nothing. We know it don't come from all of it. We know that stuff. But we didn't know that years ago. We didn't know that two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. We were just celebrating it. Praising God for it. Talking about it's the reason for the season. Talking about it's the time of year you could just feel God just moving. Right? These are things that we really believe. So we got to ask ourselves and stop. You know how dangerous that is if we continue to believe stuff like that? And how? what else are we believing like that? Only thing we can do is audit our faith. We have to go back every every year, a couple times a year, actually. My department at work has an audit. And they come to me and they're going to say, you know what? Give me all your processes. Give me your procedures. Give me everything. Procedures be like our Bible, right? Let me look through it. And I'm going to look through it, and I want to examine how you guys are working and make sure it's exactly as the procedures say. I need to find out, one, are the procedures right? Two, are y'all doing exactly what's in the procedures? Right. And three, are y'all training people to do these things consistently? That's what we have to do for our faith. We know the book is right, so we can knock one right out of there. Right. Next thing, are we teaching and are we living according to what the book is? How much of going what's going on in our life is outside a book? Right. Is against book. That is straighten us out. We do that. That is straighten us. That's John three sixteen. For God, what? For God so loved the world. You got to say that thing like you mean it, T. Let me sit in there just darn reading that. You put a little bit of, put a little bit of extra O. You know what I'm saying? There's only one O in there. But when you read it, you got to put four O's on it. God so loved the world. Go ahead. Let me playing with God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right? So God loved the world. When he say so love the world, he talking about the verses before when he said it'd be like with Moses, right? Took the brass serpent and lifted it up. And everybody who looked on that brass serpent, they were healed. He said God loved the, when it say so, it's talking about God loved the world like that, right? The way that he loved the Israelites is now how he loves the world. What he did for the Israelites is now what he's offering to the world. Everybody has been bitten by snakes that are poisonous. That's what happened to us in the wilderness. We walk around the darn wilderness, we disobey God, right? And snakes bit us, and they had poisonous. And if we didn't look at the brass serpent, serpent that Moses uh, held up that he got from God, then we'd mess around and die, right? Now he's saying that we're in the same situation. we walking around, and we've been bit by, the, by the, the temptation to sin. And unless, excuse me, unless we look up uh, at the Most High God through his son, Right? Then we in a position that we'll die. Right? This is what we're looking for. God so loved the world. In other words, God loved the world like that. All that gets lost. Right? That's why the book is precept upon precept. Because you take that one verse by itself, what does it mean to you? Absolutely nothing. It means a whole lot to these people. That's their favorite one. But it means nothing. Right. It doesn't it doesn't have any real meaning. All they God so loved the world. They looking at God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. That's it. No, that's not what God. That's cool. That's a good. It doesn't. That's what we're talking about. But that's not we're not talking about what it, we just explain what it says and we all agree on what it says. Now we're talking about how people don't know necessarily that it says what it says. Right. Without the knowledge of what God did in the wilderness, without reading the, the two previous verses, you can never understand the, the next verse. You can never understand John 3.16 as intended without reading John, John 3.14 and John 3.15. And you can never understand John 3.14 and John 3.15 without reading Exodus, without reading Numbers. Right? Because this is describing a time in the wilderness that was a challenge for us. That we were rebellious towards God. 
without all that, now your meaning, the meaning of one verse is warped. And that's why it's precept upon precept. That's why he says, who is he going to teach the knowledge to? Because you could try to read this one verse and make a mess, which people do. They think this is the name, the, the wonder, the only verse that matter in the book. Just if you just believe this verse, you'll be OK. Meanwhile, you believe in something you don't know what the intended meaning was. You're taking the understanding that you're leaning on your own understanding. God loved, loved the world so much. Guess what he did? He gave his only begotten son. <laughs> That's how much he loved the world. That's not what it's saying. I was saying he just loved the world so much that he loved, he loved the world to such a great extent that he gave his own. That's not what the word just said. Word said he loved the world like he loved Israelites. He's offering to the world the same way that he offered to the Israelites. That has a whole lot more meaning. Right? You can tie that back to something. That's history. You can look at it. You can say, okay, well, what happened to the Israelites? How can I avoid what happened to the Israelites? How did they get there? There's value in that. It's not value in some abstract idea that you pull out of your rump. You can't do nothing with that. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What else? That whosoever believes in him. That whosoever perish, believed on him. Should not perish. What's going to happen to him, though? But have everlasting life. Okay. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't send him in there to condemn him. What did he send him for? But that the world through him might be saved. Okay. He that believes on him is not condemned. All right. So if you believe on him, you ain't condemned. But he that believe not is condemned already. But if you already can, I mean, if you don't believe on him, then you condemned already. You get condemned before you started. Right. What else? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And what is the condemnation? And this is the condemnation mm -hmm. that light is coming to the world. He said light is coming to the world. And men love darkness. But men love darkness. I wonder why. Rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. Because you do evil stuff. When you ain't living right, why you going to why you want to be around light? Wouldn't make sense. That's why people, as soon as they get to living in a certain way, first thing they want to do is remove themselves or remove people out of their life who might tell them the right thing because they represent light. Let me just stay away from him. Let me just stay away from her. They get on my nerves. Right? They always judging me. Always make me feel bad. Always being negative. Right? We didn't hurt it darn all. At the end of the day, what they doing is, let me go ahead and get out this light. In the dark, you can do whatever the darn you, you can do whatever you want. Who going to see you? You want to rob a house. When you want to do it? In the midday? None of these people are crazy nowadays. You can do that in the midday. <laughs> Ideally, though, you want to wait till the sun go down. You know what I'm saying? It's nobody home. Creep on in there because you don't want to be seen. You want to wait middle of the day, whole house up, lights on, everybody eating dinner, I mean eating lunch. I don't know. That's how much light there. I bet you wouldn't want to go in there though. Right? Man, let me just relax. You know what I'm saying? You wait until everybody leaves. Now, as soon as everybody leaves, all the lights off, that's when you want to go in there and just creep around. Right? You can do whatever you want in the, in the light. I mean, in the dark. In the light, if you are, if you are a good person, right? In the sense that you obey the Most High God and follow His Son, right? If you're a disciple, you just going to walk up to the door in the middle of the day, knock on that thing, because you ain't got no wrong intention. You a darn thief. You're going to wait until nobody's there. Right? That's what we look at. If a, if a person is, is of the condemnation, they're going to hate that darn light. They're going to flock towards that darkness. What's the next one say? For everyone that does evil hates the light. Neither comes to the light lest his deed should be removed. He said everybody who hate, I mean, uh, does evil, right? They hate the light. And they're not going to come to the light. Otherwise, their deeds will be reproved. That's why people separate themselves, right? That's why people put themselves in a position. That's why you'll see Amaziah. He'll be like, you know what? This ain't none of your darn business. I didn't ask you nothing. You might want to shut up before I smack you. You better forbear before you get smitten, 
Right? That's why he would say something like that. That's why King Ahab would lock up a prophet of the Most High God. That's why Zedekiah would allow his people to lock up a prophet of the Most High God. That's why the Pharisees would lock up Yahushua. Right? That's why, that's, why, that's why the people of Judah would conspire to put Peter and Paul in jail. Because they want them out of the way because they represent light. They represent something that's going to reprove their deeds. I don't want to be corrected. I don't want nobody to tell me I'm wrong. Right? We have to put ourselves in a position where when we know we wrong, we want to be near those people. That's our only lifeline back to God. You cut yourself off, you're going to be good. I mean, you're going to be, you're going to be hurt by it. Right? You're not doing yourself no darn favor. Grab, uh, grab, uh, uh, grab Joshua chapter 7. Matter of fact, before that, grab Jeremiah chapter 20. Watch what Jeremiah said, and then we'll get Joshua. I think it can't get no darn tighter. No way darn fidgeting with it. What's wrong with you now? All right, we put ourselves in a position where we try to teach and preach the word. And people will reject. Right? And we understand it. We expect it. It comes with the territory. But for the sake of the people who do the rejecting, it's important for us to understand that that's the wrong thing to do. You put yourself now in a position that you're vulnerable to the Most High God. Right? That you will forget who the Most High God is and what he expects of you. Right? That you'll be comfortable in the sin. Right? There's no way back from that. If the Most High God give you up to your desires, how do you get back? Right? How, does he, how do you get drawn at that point? Remember, when we, to be drawn by God is to hear and to learn. If you remove yourself from hearing and learning the word, what's happening to you? You're not being drawn. You can't come to the sun outside of being drawn. Don't let anybody tell you these lies. You, there's no way to see God unless you're taught the word. Period. There's no way to see him. There's no way to know God unless you taught the word. Right? Most High God can make it happen in a lot of different ways. I guarantee you, at the end of the day, your butter be taught if you're going to see God. So if you remove yourself, how are you going to get it? It can't happen. This is, uh, this is Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 7. What would he say? Oh, Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. This is Jeremiah talking to God. Watch what he said. He said, God, you deceived me. You tricked me. Right? You are stronger than I and has prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. He said, everybody mocks me. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil, spoil because of the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. He said, since I spake, I cried out. I told these people, it's going to be some real violence and people are going to take some stuff from y'all. Because the word of the Lord came to me and told me to say it. And it became a reproach unto me. He said, God, you told me to say this stuff. And when I say this stuff, now everybody mocking me. And it's become a reproach. It's become something that's hanging over my head as judgment. People don't like me because of it. It's Jeremiah talking to God. Jeremiah, prophet. He talking to God. He's letting them know. You tricked me. All right, keep going. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. Jeremiah said, you know what? I got an idea. Every time I open up my mouth about God, these people be at my darn head. He said, I ain't saying nothing else. He said, I ain't going to make mention of him. But what happened to Jeremiah after that? But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. He said, that thing was burning in my heart. He said, I just couldn't keep my mouth shut. Keep going. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Uh-huh. He said, I mean, I tried to stop, but he said, man, that thing was real difficult. He said, I couldn't do it. Keep going. 
For I heard the defaming of many, fear on every side. Uh huh. Report say they and will report it. Right? They said they're telling him, you go ahead and prophesy. You report what God said, and we gonna tell on your butt. Right? They was all against him. You say something. You say something, we gonna darn tell on your butt. Right? Keep going. All my familiars watch from my halting, saying, Peradventure he will be enticed, and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. Uh huh. But the Lord is with me as I. As a mighty, terrible one, therefore my persecutors shall stumble, and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. But, O Lord of hosts, that tries the righteous and sees the reins, uh -huh. that seest the reins and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them. For unto you have I opened my cause. This is what, this is what Jeremiah is saying. He's like, man, this thing been real hard. You tricked me, God. You tricked me. I've been telling these people it's going to be death and darn destruction. Every time I open up my mouth, and I'm saying that because you told me to say it. And every time I open up my mouth, everybody is against me. It become a reproach against me. So you know what? I tried to shut up, God. But you know what? That thing was burning in me, man. And I couldn't. I mean, it was weary for me to, uh, to forbear. He said it was weary for me not to do it. That thing hurt me not to do it. So then I had to speak to him. He said, but I want to see vengeance on these people. I want to see, I want to see your vengeance on these people. Every darn one of them. You see the honest conversation that he has with them? This is the honest conversation that Jeremiah is having. He's looking at it like, this is what I want. He's not sitting there thinking about, Mel, well, I don't know if this is the Christian way of saying it. That's what get us caught up. When you're talking to God, I'm not telling you say this stuff to people. I'm not telling you treat no people like this. When you're talking to God, the man know your heart. He know more about what you're talking about than what you're talking about, than what you know. The book tell us that sometimes we pray in the spirit, making groans and stuff we can't even vocalize. And our spirit is, 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 is praying for us. So if we got a spirit that know more than what we know, and it can communicate more directly than God to what we know, then the stuff that we do know, you think God don't know that? Just be honest with the man. I ain't saying go to your enemies, go come to them. I just prayed that God going to kill you. Right. Then you a sinner. Right? But if you feel it in your heart, you tell God. God can work with that. Then he can correct it when it's wrong. Right? He can steer you in the right direction. He can move on your heart. We're so busy trying to hide our heart from God that he'll leave us like that. He'll leave us in our anger and in our pain and the things that we feel wrong about. The things that we think he wrong about. You see, the man Jeremiah called the man a liar. He said, you deceived me and I've been deceived. You tricked me, God. That's how we felt at the time. Right? The Most High God just giving us a glimpse into his prayer. That's important for us. I tell you, I pray. I, be, I, pray, I pray exactly how I darn feel. I be trying to, that thing, be, that thing used to feel wrong at first. Like, man, I pray exactly how I darn feel. But the Most High God, when I'm wrong, he will correct me. He'll change my mindset about the situation. Or he'll let me know why he's right. Just through reading his word. But I know I, I feel my heart move. And I'm not talking about God whispering in my ear and speaking to me. I'm just talking about my, my basic. I just look back a month later and I see I don't feel that way. Not even a temptation to feel that way. Or I do feel that way and I have a better perspective on the situation. Or I read my word and I get exactly what I was praying about. There it is right there to give me the clarity that I need. Right? These are the things that we have to be after. We have to be after having a, a real communion with the Most High God through his word. Right? Being able to have a conversation with the Most High God through his word. Through our prayers. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves out here lost thinking that we're doing something and we're not. We'll find ourselves separating ourselves from people who are really trying to help us. Right? We'll find ourselves feeling cold and getting cold. Right? Losing what we, what we once feel like we had. These things can't happen. We can't afford it. Where we got next? Joshua? It's Joshua chapter 7. This is another example of uh, 
somebody who uh somebody who uh who's wrong because when you look there's 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 a couple ways to look at this when when you are outnumbered and you're a disciple of the most high god teaching about god representing god being light the people will turn against you right that's what we saw with jeremiah the masses will turn against you but now when the people of god outnumbers the other then it switches you need to get the evil seed away from you right because that thing will bring the whole the whole party down right Matter of fact, we ain't even got to get Joshua 7. But that, we'll just kind of recap it real quick. That's what happened with Joshua. All right? They had just, Joshua had led them to take over uh, Jericho. All right? We had the priests. They had trumpets. They marched around the, 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 uh, the kingdom for seven days. You know what I'm saying? Each day they blew the trumpet. What was it, one time? Mm. And then on the seventh day, they marched around seven times. They marched around it seven times. Blowing the trumpet. Right at the, on the on the seventh time, the wall fell down. They triumphed. They killed them. They gave, they they did everything. Right, did everything. The Most High God gave it into their hand. That thing was easy money. Right. So then their next mission was to take over a place called Ai. Right. They went to go try to take over that place. Remember Jericho, biggest thing on the block. They knocked that thing over easy money. They ready now. They go to AI. AI is much smaller. They're like, man, we ain't even got to send all the men to that. What he sent, like three hundred? I don't remember how many. He sent. He sent a small, a small portion of the men at that point. He's like, man, we don't even need everybody. Yeah, just go ahead and give them three, three thousand, three. I don't remember how much it was, but go ahead and you know what I'm saying. Just go send a few of them over there. They looking at it. They like, man, we got this done. Most I got. Tore they butt up when they went in there. The people of AI tore they butt up. They went away. Joshua start freaking out. Joshua was like. What in the world? All right, we got to get it. I can't help. It. This is Joshua chapter 7. Give me verse. What do I want? Verse 6? Verse 6 might be a little too high. Maybe verse 15. 15 might be too low. I want Joshua reaction. Where is that? 12? It is 7. Oh, it was. It was up Six. there. 6? Yeah. All, the way up All right, go ahead. It's six. It's Joshua verse seven. I mean, chapter seven, verse six. And Joshua ripped his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until eventide. Uh huh. He and the elders of Israel and put dust on their heads. Uh huh. And Joshua said, "Alas, O Lord God." Why have you at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us in the hand of the Amorites to right? destroy us? He said, "Why in the world did you bring us over here just to kill us?" He says, this, this don't make no sense, God. You brought us all the way over here. You made us wait in the wilderness 40 years. We thought you was going to take us in here, and then now you kill us? He's like, what was this all for? He yelling to God, honest conversation with him. He's like, uh, uh, can you explain this to me? Watch what God say. This is what God's reaction is. I wish to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. He said, we would have been good if we had just satisfied dwelling on the other side of Jordan. All right, keep going. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns their back before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us, us round, environ us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do unto your great name? Look, so he already imagining how the Canaanites going to hear about them losing. They about to team up, get confidence. And so he imagining they whole failure right now. This is an honest conversation with God. He didn't go out to the men and be like, we're about to lose. Oh, no, guys, it's that another. He didn't do that. He went out, he tore his clothes, and he started praying to the Most High God with his thoughts. Right? Watch how the Most High God deal with it. And the Lord said unto Joshua. I love God. Watch this. Watch what he say. Real quick and simple. Get thee up. Get your butt up. Why you lie this way upon your face? You look ridiculous. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and, dis and disassembled, dissembled also, and they have put it even amongst their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. 
Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed from among you. Right? So he let him know, man, what you, what you laying there for? Get your butt up. You look ridiculous. This only happened because somebody sinned, boy. They got the accursed thing. I told y'all, don't touch the accursed thing. And somebody got it. You thought I was playing. So now I ain't with you unless you get rid of his butt. Right? And then we fast forward. They cast lots. They brought family by family, right? Until they found out it was Aiken, right? Then they, they, we ended up—they ended up—we uh, ended up stoning them to death. You know what I'm saying? Him and his family, right? Yeah, yeah him, him, and, his him family. and all that he had. Yeah, yeah, him and his family stoned them all. Had a heap of stones, and we called it the Valley of Acor. You know what I'm saying? Because we stoned them. Because we had to get rid of the person who was disobedient within the group. And then God was with us at that point. We saw that also, we don't have to get it, but we saw that also with Jonah. Right? Jonah was with Gentiles. Jonah was being disobedient. Most high God, he provoked them and throwed, in, throwed Jonah out the boat. Otherwise, that boat was going to be gone. So it works both ways. You want to be near a man of God when there's obedience. Right? When there's no obedience now, and you got a you got a group of people of God that got a mission. They got to get rid of your butt. That's why the book that it, it clearly tells us. It says, uh, uh, "What is what am I thinking about? Be ye holy. Uh, get out from among them, and be ye separate. Come out from among them and be ye separate. All right? Be holy for I am holy. Don't be we look unequally yoked with unbelievers. Yeah, we have to put ourselves in a position where." We don't dwell with known sinners. Righteousness. What does righteousness have to do with Belial? All right. Grab, uh, where we at? We Joshua. What else we got there? Anything that we need? Let's go back to Acts. All right, because we look at Paul. Paul was inside the ship. He told him, man, listen, it thinks some people are going to lose their life messing around with this. All right? They didn't listen to him. They kept going. Paul come back and like, listen, I just, I just talked to the angel. Ain't nobody going to lose their life, but we're going to lose just about everything else. All right? But God said he gave them everybody who's with them. All right? That's real powerful. And you'll see that they, since with, through that experience, you'll see that they know Paul is a man of God. All right? That they want to deal with him. Truth be told, it would be wise of them to continue to try to be near Paul. All right? A lot of people know that. Look at us, right? If you look at us, you look at Israel. You have, you have first captivity, we'll call it uh, Egypt. All right? The moment we went into Egypt, Egypt, I mean, Egypt was already doing good, right? Mm -hmm. the moment we went into Egypt, what happened? Egypt was extremely rich. No. Oh, Egypt got they had to go through that famine first. Oh, yeah. Right? But he had a plan. The Most High God put a plan in for Joseph to make them rich through the famine. Through the famine, they ended up buying up all the land. Right? No, you're right. They had plenty of years first. Mm -hmm. Yep, so you're right. They did. They got rich first, right? Plenty of years first. And then they had the famine, bought up all the land. Then after that, they had us as slaves. So by us being there, the Most High God blessed Egypt, right? Then we come out. We go into the wilderness. Egypt shuts all the way down. That whole empire at that time stopped, right? We come out. Then we go to... Um, we go to the lands of Canaan and everything. Uh, then after that, the Assyrians take over our people. It just so happens the Assyrians at that time were the largest empire. One of the, this is the, one of the most infamous empires in history. Right? And we were under their rule. Then after that, you have the Babylonians, another infamous empire in history. And we were under their rule. Then after that, you had the Greeks. The Grecian Empire, the Macedonian Empire, 
All right, well, you got skips a few. So you had the Persians, you know what I'm saying, the Medes, all those infamous. All these are very well known. Then you had a, the Grecian and Macedonian Empire, right? Again, very well known. Then lastly, you had a Roman Empire. All of these empires, what they have in common is us. And even though historians are trying to make it seem like we were a small part in all this, even they have to acknowledge that all of them fought for our land. All of them fought for control of our land and our regions. It's, it was other empires in the world. Why wasn't they as big? It didn't stop with the Romans. After that, you had an Ottoman Empire. Also fought for our land. For control of our land. Right? We were exiled. We went into Africa. A lot of people won't tell you. But because of us, the Africans did well. So you got the Mali Empire, right? You have the, uh, the Timbuktu empires, right? All these different places, they don't teach you a whole lot about them, but those places were glorious due to us. We were there. The Saudi Arabians, we was over there too. They still got us enslaved over there today. And then lastly, we ended up coming to America. And what do you know? They call it the richest country ever. And why? Because we here. Truth be told, a lot of these people know by having us that they better off. Just because they near the people of God. When they when they had us uh, enslaved, what the one thing they the, they not gonna really promote. They're right now, what they are doing is they going around and the Confederate flags down south. All them thing coming down. They taking down all the Confederate flags. You can read about it and see it on the news. They taking down all the Confederate flag, taking all them things down. Then they also got statues of like generals and everything that fought for the Confederates. Getting rid of their bus too. They taking all the statues down, getting rid of it. People outraged. Some of the people outraged about it because they like, this is history. All right? They're like, you going to take down this stuff? This is history. They taking all that junk down. They say, it's racist. Get rid of it. When we going to talk about Mount Rushmore? <laughs> When we going to talk about that? I mean, I, I get it. I mean, Confederate flag for sure. That thing real. Yeah, that's messed up. When we going to talk about Mount Rushmore? Who on Mount Rushmore? We got George. I know we got George, George Washington. Washington. Owned a slave, right? He owned slaves. What's Who the, else? What's the, what's the guy's name? Uh, not one of the Thomas Jefferson looking. Thomas, uh, uh, is it Thomas Jefferson? Uh, Benedict. Oh, I know. No, 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 no not Benedict. Benedict. What's his name? Man? Thomas. Ain't it Thomas Jefferson? Uh, I think, I think it's Thomas, Thomas Jefferson. Jeff, yeah, Thomas Jefferson. Who, Yo, John, on, a, John who, on a, who on a nickel? That's mm. who got a nickel? Monticello. <laughs> I think it is Thomas Jefferson, right? He the one that I think he the one that wrote the uh, concept, uh, wrote the Independence, right? No, that's John Hancock. No, right? he signed it. Oh, yeah, huh? John Hancock signed it. Washington, Thomas yeah, Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. Guess, guess what they say about Thomas Jefferson? But he was Native American? No. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, he, he is a racist butt, too. This is the man that wrote. Thomas Jefferson, the man that wrote, he said, I hold it to be self-evident. We all hold it to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Then at the same time, he has quotes talking about how black people ain't equal. And he owned slaves. And he said, and he said, and he said, you know what? If black people do get free, they got to go somewhere else. Who else was on there? Abraham Lee. Theodore Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. They talk about him, right? They talk about him. Teddy Roosevelt. That's a good. Teddy Roosevelt. His butt racist, too. You know what he used to support? He used to support eugenics. He used to always talk. And he said, you know what? These people... These people, and that, that's how he would say, he wouldn't say black people explicitly. He would say, these people who are criminals and this, that, and the other and poor should not have a right to have their seed uh, propagated in the world. So in other words, he wants you to stop. Don't have no more kids. You good. Then he come back and he came, he said the African, I forgot exactly how he said it. He said the African races are something. Something he said. But basically, they less than human. That's Mount Rushmore. Who else we had? Abraham Lincoln. 
Abraham Lincoln get a pass because he freed the slave, didn't he? Yes, they say. Abraham Lincoln got a quote. Abraham Lincoln got a quote saying, he said, I am of the white race. And I think just as any man would, that they would want their own race to be superior. And I don't think I'm any different. Yeah, he, they, they were willing to the man, after he emancipated, after he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, they dug up some records. He tried to make a deal with Britain to say, uh, if, we, if, if we let them free, we going to deport them to y'all colonies in the Caribbean. They're going to send us to Belize and, uh, and uh, Ghana, I think. Ghana, Ghana. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Right? They're going to send us to them darn islands and put us over there with the rest of our people, with the Jamaicans, with the Belizeans and all that. They're going to stuff us over there. And we see what's going over there right now. Right? This is, this is the people that we look. This is Mount Rushmore. This is they people. This is they claim to fame. This is the, this is the founders of their nation. And they want to talk to us. They want to try to pat us on the back with some Confederate flag. Let's talk about it. Take down the American flag. That's we're slave. I mean, we were slaves under the American flag. Y'all were trying to deport us and try to get us up out of here under the American flag. Y'all were telling us that we wouldn't like y'all under the American flag. Right? Even uh, Benjamin Franklin. You can't find much on Benjamin Franklin, but he is like, well, yeah, all of them. All of them. He is like, he is like well, white men, uh, he said white men are, uh, what did he say? He said white men are few in number in comparison to the rest of the world. He said, so what sense does it make to continue to bring the African here to give them growth? All these people ought to Burn in hell if they didn't repent before they died. So much stuff. They don't tell us about none of it. But they, you know what they want us to do? Accept it and forget it. Why y'all don't forget the people that's racist? Why we got to forget the racism and then remember the person that committed it? We just got to ignore it. We got to forget what was done to our people, but we got to remember the people that did it. That's real convenient. Why don't y'all forget them? Get them off y'all mountains. Rip up your Declaration of Independence. They wrote it, and they were liars when they wrote it. All men created equal. You a hypocrite. Get rid of y'all stuff. Why, why we can't remember and y'all can remember y'all stuff? Y'all can select and remember everything that y'all say is good. And we got to pretend like, like everything else didn't happen? No, I think that's crazy, me personally. I just think that's crazy. Because they know, right? They know. By being next to us, this nation do real well. They knew that. That's why they wanted to keep us as slaves. You know who was fighting for us? The Confederates. Confederates like, no, nah, lead these boys here. Y'all crazy trying to send these boys. Why y'all trying to send these boys off? We doing real well. We doing real nice right now. Right? It's no dip. Grab, uh, grab Genesis chapter 30. Watch this. It's Genesis chapter 30. Tell me if this sounds familiar. It's Genesis chapter 30, verse 25. Ain't going to get me to stop talking about race. I think it's beautiful. I think it give me, a, I think it give us all a real dynamic. And don't try to make me out to be the bad guy. Y'all started it. I'm just setting the record straight. How you gonna start? How you gonna start talking about uh, black people are less than human, right? They animals. They not as smart. And then when we get to talking about, hey, all that stuff was lies. That stuff don't bring it up no more. So y'all can put all this narrative out into the world, and we can't. We gotta feel guilty about correcting the record. Now, when we talk about race, we wrong. We reverse races. Yeah, we reverse races when 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 y'all all y'all y'all people poor. When the majority of y'all people make less than uh, less than fifty percent of the rest of the nation. That's when yeah, that's that's when that's when we can reverse racism. 
when we got control of the country, that's when we reverse racism. And somebody did. One of us did call him a cracker. It don't affect him. You call me an N-word, it, it has effect. This is Genesis chapter 30, verse uh, 25. Watch this. Tell me if it sounds familiar. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go into my own place, into my own country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I served you, and let me go. For right. you know my service which I have done you. So Jacob was like, man, just send me away. You know I served you. It's time for me to go now, right? Let me go. Let me free. Let's see what Laban said. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in your eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. The Lord has blessed me for what? Your sake. He said, I knew it. He said, I've learned from experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Keep going. And he said, appoint me your wages and I will give it. Right? So then Laban was like, man, just tell me what you want to make. Write a number down. I'll give it to you. Laban was like, man, I know how much this thing worth. Don't even worry about it. Tell me what you want. Right? Let's hear about it. And he said unto him, you know how I have served thee and how your cattle was with me. Uh -huh. For it was little which you had before I came, and now it is increased unto a multitude. Mm -hmm. And the Lord has blessed you since my coming, and now when I shall provide for my own house also. And he said. All right. So he looked at him. He's like, he's trying to tell him, man, you already know. Don't pay me nothing. I'm just trying to let you know. You know that you was blessed for my sake. You know what I'm saying? Just let me go. All right? Go, uh, go to the next chapter. This is Genesis chapter 31. Genesis chapter 31, verse 36. It's Genesis chapter 31, verse 36. What you looking at, boy? Genesis chapter 31, verse 36. And Jacob was wroth and chode with Laban. Uh -huh. And Laban answered and said, and Laban, and Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that you have so hotly pursued after me? Uh huh. Where is thou hast searched all my stuff? What has you found of all your household stuff? Right. Set it here before my brethren and your brethren, that they may judge between us both. All right, watch what Jacob say now. This 20 years have I been with you. He said this, 20 years have I been with you. What else? Your ewes and your she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of your flock have I not eaten. He said, man, I've been taking care of all your animals. Right? He said, I didn't take nothing from you. What else? That which was torn of beasts I brought not unto you, I bear the loss of it. Right. Of my hand did you require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. He said, if something happened to anything while I was watching it, you required it of me. Right? These your sheep. But if I ended up losing one of your sheep or uh, one of your sheep was lost on my watch, I had to give you one of my sheep. Took it out of my check. Right? He said, that everything was required in my hand. You always got yours. You never suffered loss. I suffered loss. Right? He said, 20 years it's been like this. I've been serving you. Keep going. Thus I was in the day the drought consumed me and the frost by night and my sleep departed from my eyes. Uh-huh. Thus have I been 20 years in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for the cattle. He said, you tricked me for your darn daughters. I came in trying to marry Rachel. You snuck Leah in there to me. And then told me I had to work an additional seven years. I worked seven years trying to get Rachel. You gave me Leah instead. Then told me if I really want Rachel, work another seven years. So I worked them seven years, 14 years down the drain. Then you asked me to stay and keep your cattle. That's another six years I kept your cattle. He said, I've been here 20 years. And what happened next? You have changed my wages 10 times. He said, you've changed my wages uh, 10 times in this 20 years. Keep going. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the, and the fear of Isaac had been with me. Surely you had seen, you had sent me away now empty. Mm -hmm. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you yesterday. And Do you think it makes any sense that we've been here since 1619? 
1619, the Constitution, the, the, the U.S. Constitution was like 17 what? The independence of 17 what? 17 something? 1776 or something like that. 1770. Let's go with it. I don't care nothing about these people's history or all that much anyway. You know what I'm saying? That's probably wrong anyway. But you, let's say it's 1776. We got here just over 100 years before this place actually was notified and ratified or whatever they call it, as a country. And we was here before that. And you mean to tell me that we still the brokest uh, community? We still the most downpressed community? It sounds like somebody changed our darn wages. You mean to tell me we built the country and we don't have any of the property? You mean to tell me our people designed the White House? Our people built the White House? And it ain't until 2008 we get somebody in there? That's just a figurehead. That in a lot of ways was harder on our people than a lot of the ones that came before them. At the very least, just as hard on our people. Right? We have to look at this and we have to ask ourselves, our wages have been changed, huh? Something been changed here. They give us a whole lot of packs, the New Deal, affirmative action, all these different things we have. The voting right, you got you to gotta re-vote on the voting right every few years. Why? Right? Why? 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 Why we always why? Why white people? We ain't got to do no vote to make sure they can vote. Right? Nobody in Congress got to vote to make sure white people can vote. Black people though, they got to do that thing. Well, I don't know how, how how often it is, but it has an expiration date. Let's put it like that. Every time they read, they revote on it. Like, why is that? A whole lot of weirdness going on. Sound like our wages being changed. Right? We look at these things, and when you look at it, 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 you know, it just might be coincidence. But when you know what's going on, this is not coincidence. We the people of the most high God. And these people are blessed to have us here, and they know that. But just like anything else, when we get up out of here, it's going to be some real vengeance. Just like Jeremiah was talking about, man, they mock me. I want to see vengeance on this place. That's what's going to happen. This is, uh, this is uh, Isaiah. Give me Isaiah chapter uh, 61. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 4. Is Isaiah chapter 61, verse 4. What does the book say? And they shall build the old wastes. They shall raise they shall up do the what? former desolations. They said they're going to build up the old waste and raise up the former desolation. He's talking about our land. A lot of people don't realize this. We're going back to the land. And the stuff that y'all see there going on now, that stuff ain't going to be happening long. We're going to go back to the land. They say they're going to build, they say they going to build up the old waste. They shall build up, they shall build the old waste. They shall raise up the former desolation. Uh -huh. And they shall repair the waste cities and de uh, the desolations of many generations. Uh-huh. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the Who going to be feeding our flocks? Strangers. Strangers going to be feeding our flocks, huh? That's real interesting. He said Gentiles going to be feeding our flocks. What else going to happen? And the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. They said war foreigners are going to be the ones that, that are our plowers and vine dressers. That sounds real familiar, don't it? Most high God going to flip this whole thing on these people. Right? Keep going. But you shall be named the priests of the Lord. 
Mm -hmm. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Mm -hmm. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall you boast yourselves. He said, we going to eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory, we going to boast ourselves. All the stuff that they glory about, that's going to be our riches. Keep going. For your shame, you shall have double. And for your confusion, they shall, and for confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. He said, in our land, we're going to have the double. And we're going to have everlasting joy. You see everlasting, what does that tell them? Forever. Got to be Yahweh sure. Right? This is kingdom talk that he's talking about. We're looking at it. We think, oh, no, this is kingdom talk. He said, we're going to have servants as Gentiles. Right? Keep going. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. An uh, everlasting what? Covenant with them. That's New Testament. Right? We look at these things, it's important that we know them. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes we look at it as like, oh, why are we talking about race? These are factual things in the book that have to be dealt with. Have to be taught. Remember, we've been taught the book from a Gentile perspective. A Gentile can never pick that up. And they can never pick up something in the book where it's saying that the Gentile is going to serve you in the everlasting covenant. They, you've never seen that taught in church. It's there in the book. It's right there. It's talking about everlasting covenant. It tells you a Gentile is going to be serving them. Talking about Israelites. Right? You let some of these, these Christians tell it, they'll tell you that. Gentiles replaced the Israelites because the Israelites rejected Christ. The Jews rejected Christ, so therefore Christians replace them. That don't make sense if that's the case. Right? Who a Gentile and who a Israelite if that's the case? Who a Gentile and who a Jew? Wouldn't matter, right? They'll tell you it don't matter, right? They'll take Paul when Paul say neither Greek nor Jew. All right? They'll take that and they'll be like, see, it don't matter. What that mean then? That's all about everlasting covenant. That's why the book has to be precept upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Our, our lineage does matter. It absolutely matters. It does not matter for salvation. Right? You can be saved in any lineage that you choose. How that thing plays out though, the position that you have in the kingdom, it's all dependent on lineage, actions, and things that you do. Knowledge of the word. The position that we play in the events that are to come are very dependent on lineage, location, things of that nature. It's important that we know because a lot of this stuff is going to get tricky soon. Everybody's going to be looking at one group of people as the stuff starts to hit the fan. And right through the back door, another group of people is going to be walking in. Everybody's going to have their eyes on one group of people like, what's going to happen? Oh, is this what Revelation was talking about, looking in the wrong direction? And right before their eyes, something else is going to be happening. And it's going to put people in a position where they think they're worshiping the right thing, and they're going to end up being, to worship the wrong thing. They think they're following the right thing, and they're going to end up following the wrong thing. We have to be prepared for when these things happen. Right? To help our brother, not prepare for us and for our glory, to help our brothers and sisters and to help those that would be allies to us. Right? Those that are allies to God so that we can all help each other through a tough time. This is definitely going to get more difficult. Any questions? Let's go ahead and pray out.